Rescue Up, response is engine 5, engine 3, engine 1, ladder 3, ladder 2, rescue 1. We've got smoke showing. Division 1, you're on location, block 23, reporting smoke show on 727. Welcome to Job Talks Podcast. Our goal is to facilitate knowledge sharing. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests on the show belong solely to the people expressing them. We do not represent the departments, cities, or towns we work for. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> to another episode of Job Talks Podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I appreciate you. Here we are, getting ready to round out our season number two goes by quick we appreciate you guys for being here don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and uh barry take us away all right what's up guys uh so we're gonna go into a topic to kind of catapult us into some of the episodes we have coming up into the future uh in season three uh but this is the role of rope in the fire service so when i cra uh, crafted this episode um I wanted to make sure that like we cover kind of all facets rope. We're not going to get far off into right field with uh, like rigging different systems, anything like that. Solid left field uh, guys here. <laughs> solid left field guys. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the role of rope in the fire service uh, and what that means from the junior guy first day on the job in a very small rural volunteer department all the way through uh, rope being utilized in like a heavy, uh, dense urban uh, department. So we'll get into it. I have to say when you, when you, brought this subject up to me i initially was like this sounds like a really good topic that i'm not going to be able to speak to at all but then we talked a little bit more about it and i'm really excited to go through this because yeah when you see a rope you automatically think like tech rescue yeah and this is much more than tech rescue no so, so rope is uh, rope is very much the indispensable tool so regardless of like you know I, I i started this with a question right so what is the small volunteer midwestern department a wildland firefighting crew, a fireboat crew, suburban call agency, regional tech rescue team, urban search and rescue, wilderness search and rescue, confined space team, and a busy urban fire department all have in common. Well, small bank accounts and broken marriages. That, and they all use, interact, and must be knowledgeable with rope. Wow. So in my mind, um, rope is the single most indispensable tool, arguably, in the fire service, right? You use it for absolutely everything, whether you realize it or not, right? It remains the single essential tool in any fire and emergency services toolbox, supports everything from the most simple daily operations of like hauling something, carrying something, all the way through to the absolute high-end, high-end technical rescue. And it all takes place with a single piece of rope or more, right? So we use it a lot. So I wanted to kind of highlight the, you know, like when, when we talk about rope, it's so underestimated as a daily tool that we use. And we'll dive into all the different ways. I have, Nick's going to be mad because I have like six pictures per page times three pages of all the different ways that we can use rope. Moving forward, we'll change that. Um, but just to highlight the raw versatility of rope, right? So often underestimated, in my opinion, it's one of the singularly most important tools we're going to use in our career. It's heavily utilized in almost an infinite amount of applications, Right talk about utility rope like everyone has like usually they have like a utility rope on their scba i don't know if do you guys have those little bags so utility rope um you can use it from everything <coughs> from hauling right moving securing stuff tying stuff down uh, when i talk about rope i'm also inclu including webbing in the conversation everybody uses it so we use utility <laughs> rope for yeah almost everything yeah stuff yeah. around the station hauling lines yep. it's a, securing it's, things it's a huge part of the academy itself Yep, literally learning to tie yeah, knots. ropes and knots. Yeah, that's one yeah. of the few additional pieces of equipment that um, my department issued. They went out and bought a bunch of webbing, and they cut everybody a twelve foot section of it. Oh, nice! So, you know, knotted it up, put it in your, put it in your, uh, one of your pants pockets, just to have for uh, you know whatever it is, either extrication or you know some sort of yeah. bailout tool if you need it. Even though it's not a lot, I mean, you could make some sort of use out of it if you had. You to. could, yeah, yeah. You can use you can use webbing from everything from like moving like you can use webbing to i mean i have a picture of it you can use webbing to put on your back to carry additional scba bottles or yep. secure something all the way through dragging a victim out yep. yeah right it's such a uh, under under thought of tool that we utilize every day yeah absolutely. um 
<clears throat> all the way through life safety rope. We'll talk about kind of the differences and hallmarks of utility versus life safety, some of which you guys might be familiar with, right? But light safety rope, you use it from repelling, belaying, rescue, stabilization, large incident search, rip, marine rescue, and then last, you know, water water rope rescue. So when I like I talked to Will making this episode, he's like, oh, he's like, I, I you know, I don't feel like I can bring much to the conversation as far as rope. And I kind of pushed back. I was like, actually, I think you use rope almost like every day and you don't even realize it. Mm. Right? So water rescue rope, marine operations, yeah. recovery, ice rescue, all the way from like using rope on the marine unit to just tie it to a slip. Like you can't just, right. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but there is a certain way to utilize yeah, rope absolutely. in marine operations. And right? I think that's really important just in in talking in general. And like we said, is like it's under thought of. Like, yeah. we, like it, when you brought this up to me, I immediately I went to tech rescue, but there's so many rope applications and uh so yeah I'm, I'm excited about this yep personal safety systems yeah. bail kits right. guess what <clears throat> these rope right all the way through webbing systems like we talked about um webbing again has almost an infinite amount of applications so uh this picture actually is with matt uh matt mcdonald he was in the last group uh so that's us at a rope class uh, i think that's me struggling to get off of his ass um he, like you're trying to like lift up so this this specific scenario um, is you have to like convert, you have to take them off of their system. It's like a dead system. You have to take them off of their system, put you on theirs and then like maneuver out. But that was Matt. So I was hoping he was going to be here for that. Um, <clears throat> but so we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff. Um, I characterize myself as having like, I'm, I'm by no means a seminary manager expert with rope. I think I have like a functional knowledge, um, rope rescue three technician. Um, but again, that just gives you the basic in the door, like, functional knowledge like you need to like take the class and then you need to go out and like do it so yeah create a working knowledge create right? a working yeah. knowledge yeah. yep so I'm still working on my working knowledge let me put it that way <laughs> should be whole yeah. your whole and, career right and you always will be exactly. yep. <laughs> so here are some of the ways that we use rope right so we're gonna throw all these pictures up nick like i said i apologize um but from the everyday stuff you don't think of ice rescue right Water rescue rope. Uh, the top right corner uh, is the Anderson rescue strap, which is a combination of a carabiner, uh, and then you. This is like their patent pending. They have like the the two holders as well. Uh, that's called. That's kind of a more commercial variant of combining the use of tools and carabiners with webbing to create an efficient system for rescue. Uh, in the bottom left hand corner, everyone's probably familiar, probably on every engine company or ladder company or ambulance, right? A water rescue throw rope, right? Uh, the middle picture is utilizing webbing to extricate a victim or firefighter. And then the bottom right is the classic, like, large area search for it, right? What's the common denominator? There's ropes involved. Next period, next uh, group of pictures, right? So personal safety systems bailout kit there on the left. Um, the top right, the larger one, hauling, right? Hauling lines, whether you have uh, a difficult entrance from the exterior of a structure, you're doing a well stretch, something like that, and someone just throws down a utility rope, tie, uh, you tie like a, you know, clove hitch or whatever you want, bring it up, and you can get that line into operation, right? Um, kind of the middle-ish one, uh, that's a system that I had set up a while ago for converting off of a, um, off of a line. That middle one. As again, like we talked about, using webbing to your advantage. There's a million and one applications for webbing. So that was for a high-rise fire where they needed to carry a lot of bottles up to staging. So they came up with a way of just simply, you know, utilizing webbing in a way that's efficient. You can carry uh, two bottles in your hands plus three on your back uh, and get a bunch of lines in place. And then um, the bottom corner picture, um, which I believe I have a, a larger picture of a little bit later on, uh, which is the... Um, High point anchor system. Mm -hmm. We've briefly touched on that in a previous episode, but using mechanical advantage to help extricate someone from a structure. <coughs> um, it's a very simple system, but it's very effective, and we've seen the use of that here in Massachusetts. And the last bank of pictures, right? Uh, so this is getting into some of the more uh, higher end of the spectrum stuff, but again, like this could be anything from a wildland crew. So this top left hand top picture um, was from my rope rescue three class. Um, and we had guys from the Department of Forestry, uh, from or U.S. Forest Service, rather. Uh, and we were using their vehicle as the hard point to secure and build a system off of. So it doesn't necessarily, like, you can be building systems or you can be utilizing ropes in the middle of the woods and using a pickup truck as, like, the anchor. Um, or you can be, uh, the picture on the right is in Miami at my Technician 1 and 2, and that's actually using a building. So it can be anywhere from, like, urban to rural to anywhere in between. 
the bottom left, again, that was in Concord, New Hampshire, um, with the Arizona Vortex. Uh, and then the middle picture is, again, um, everyone's familiar with RIT, the concept of RIT. We've had an episode on it. But, again, utilizing webbing to your advantage to help extricate someone from a structure. So the point being um, is there's almost like an infinite amount, infinite um, applications for a rope, right? Um, it can be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, everything from the systems themselves to assistive assistive devices for the systems. Um, yeah. Oh, I actually forgot something. I got you guys gifts. Hold on, I'll be right back. For this episode. Got you guys All right. I bet it's a piece of rope. I hope it is. Barry's actually. Do we have waiting room music, Nick. Barry's actually going to give us a uh, piece of rope and then test us on tying knots. Thank you. Wow, that was nice. We need an right. intro like yeah. that from now on. I like that. So there's some ropes for you guys to tinker with during the presentation. I, I, what's funny is immediately I'm like, I just want to tie things. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you can do yeah, figure eight. Don't really, this is uh, the most basic knot. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, I did a one-handed figure eight for my testing at the academy to just be funny, and the instructor didn't think it was funny. Although I did it right. Um, yeah. Am I supposed to untie this? No, no. No, you can do whatever you want. It's your rope. It's my rope. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and fun, like, fun fact. So, like, when I went to the, my, my first technician class, I was really worried because I couldn't remember, like, a lot of the no, uh, ropes from the academy and, or the ropes and knots from the academy. And I was, like, spending a lot of time, like, oh, I need to, like, Bolin, Beckett, like, Clove Hitch, like, mm-hmm. figure eight, figure eight on a bite, like, figure eight on a follow through. Uh, there's a common misconception. You really don't use a lot of knots in rope system. Like, there's knots that you utilize. Um, but a lot of them can, like, you can use, like, a figure eight, figure eight, and a bite, figure eight, follow through. Like, you can use a lot of this, like, the same, like, three knots. Like, you don't have to be, like, a knot savant to be good with technical rescue. And I was like, I was like, oh, I got to know, like, these 50 knots. Mm-hmm. And I think I used, like, two or three throughout the entire class. And the rest is, like, using stuff in systems. Um, but, yeah, so the point being is, like, like, when I was talking with you, Will, like, people often overlook rope as, like, in general, like, Think about how much man has utilized rope for mm. to like either accomplish a task, make a task easier or help assist us in some way. And it's, um, it's no, uh, no surprise that that has bled over into the fire service. You use your rope or some, some variation of rope in a chain, right. For almost everything, right. hoisting, winching, hauling, life safety, day to day stuff. We were just talking the other day at the station about doing open area searches or parking garages yeah. way underground and stuff like that. And, having a rope bag, you know what I mean? So again, like, yeah, you, you use it for everything. Yeah. Are you making handcuffs? What are you doing over there? No, this is just a clove hitch. The first knot that I used after the Academy. California love knot. Was on my boat. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause we have, uh, what are the things that you dangle off the side? The bumpers, the bumpers. Bumpers. Yeah. I always forget the name of those, the bumpers. And I'm like, well, how am I going to dangle this off the side? Cause I use like the, like the Chrome railing to do it. And so I used a clove hitch. And I was yeah. like, huh, thank you, Fire Academy. Yeah. There you go. The, oh, this stuff bleeds into, like, everyday life, yeah. too. Like, yeah, stuff helps. Tying Probably knots so. and pulling stuff around the yard yeah. and different things. Like, yeah. Absolutely. So. Uh, what was that voice? Rope characteristics, right? So <clears throat> given the fact that there's almost an infinite amount of applications for rope, how do we determine which rope is appropriate for which job? So you guys are holding your hands, technically, life safety rope, right? So how do we make the determination in between whether, hey, do we need life safety rope? Do you need utility rope, right? So I'm going to throw a bunch of terms out there, and we'll, co- we'll talk about rope construction and selecting the appropriate rope and the appropriate assistive tools for the job that we're doing. Um, but first, you have to have, like, a basic understanding of some of the fundamental terms, right? So with so many varying applications and types of rope, it's super easy to get confused on what the appropriate rope for the job is. Like, hey, can we, can we use utility rope for this? Can we use, do we have to use life safety rope? Like, what type of life safety rope do we have to use, right? But generally, it's split into two specific mission types, utility and life safety, right? And it's it's pretty easy to make the determination between the two, right? So utility rope, 
uh, is a rope that's used for any other function other than life safety, right? So there's no no one's life, no one is physically being suspended on the line, or no one's life Im- is immediately depending on the rope. Like if that, sometimes you'll talk to people and they'd be like, "Oh, like life safety rope is there's there's a human life being is." It's being suspended on that rope system. Mm-hmm. Uh, my interpretation is like there's no one's life that is immediately depending on that system, right? So there's someone that might be on that system, but whether if that system fails, right, if that immediately jeopardizes someone's life, I would quantify that as like we need to use life safety rope. Uh, and ne- sometimes necessarily it doesn't change the rope. It just changes the safety factor that's involved. Uh, we'll talk about that. But generally, um, utility rope, you know, tie ropes, practice ropes, uh, rigging ropes, roof ropes, uh, and, you know, hauling tools, hauling lines, stuff like that. Uh, they all kind of fa- fall under the category of like a utility rope, right? Uh, life safety, uh, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, any rope that is used to support the weight of members or any other persons during the rescue, firefighting, or emergency operations or during training evolutions. So that's something that's important, right? So sometimes like people can get killed in training just as easily as on the fire ground. So... I mean, it should be self-explanatory, but anytime you have uh, someone on the line, whether it's in training or not, uh, you need to be using life safety rope. So we're going to continue on. Uh, I feel like like ropes are like such a simple concept that, that there's so much to them. And there's so much like kind of, well, hazmat's just kind of a complicated topic. In general. No, but I think that's <laughs> anything you get into is like yeah. you you as the end user only get exposed to the like here's life safety and here's utility. Yeah. Not the the reason this is life sta- safety is it has a the safety factor of this, the inside yeah. is braided, it has a yeah. dynamic low, you know, whatever stretch for falling or whatever yeah. the case is. You're just not exposed to that. And that a lot of times research, you know. A lot of times like you can unless the rope has been like shock loaded or there's some like incident, <clears throat> like you can, they'll, a lot of people will use like retired life safety rope as utility rope. Right. Um, as long as it's nothing in here. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go through like the key terms that I, I think, and again, I'm just one person, but I'm going to kind of go through the key terms that I think are at least important for that, like basic fundamental, uh, understanding of like the rope world. Um, but so there's a couple of t- key terms and these are the ones I think that it's uh, important to be familiar with and particularly in like the life safety realm. So you'll hear the terms static and dynamic, right? Like, oh, this is like a dynamic rope. This is a static rope. And to me, that's kind of misleading, right? So static, like when I think static, you think like non-moving, right? But a, a static, like to me, like no rope system is truly static. There's always movement uh, within the system and potentially movement within the rope, right? I think a better way to characterize that is the rope is low stretch, right? Because any rope, or any system um, can contract or expand mm-hmm. when like pressure is exerted on it. Yeah. Um, or if there's like a shock load to the system, it's not like a complete hard stop, right? It's right. a fibrous material. There's going to be a little bit of tensioning in it. Um, so I think a better way to characterize it and for people to understand is it's not like when you think static, just think like there's not a lot of stretch within the system. Like some are more forgiving than others. Like, mm-hmm. A really dynamic system would be like bungee jumping, right? That's a very high stretch rope versus right. something that's more static that's not designed to have that much like flexion in the system. So low stretch um, and high stretch are like I think more accurately describe and identify like real world conditions, right? But if you were to describe them, right? So low stretch, static uh, are life safety ropes that have a relatively low stretch ratio, typically between ten and twenty percent until failure, right? Uh, this is kind of due to like the non-spiral construction. Uh, we're going to throw up this picture. The people that are, uh, video watchers can see this and I'll kind of talk through the anatomy of a rope. Um, but for the, uh, for the audio listeners, I'll kind of provide like the, the actual book definition of like low stretch static versus dynamic or low stretch versus high. Right. So low stretch, that ratio is between 10 and 20% until you're going to induce a failure. Uh, and that's due to the non-spiral, uh, constructed core. Uh, two to five percent elongation. So, like I said, even in like low stretch or static rope, like once you uh, put weight or induce stress on the system, there is going to be elongation or elongation rather. Um, but it's how much are you getting within that given system, right? So, um, about two to five percent will occur due to a working load, uh, and then you have high stretch or dynamic, uh, which is a relatively high stretch ratio, twenty to fifty percent until you induce failure, uh, and that's due to a more spiral constructed core bundle. Uh, operation uh, operationally utility ropes are more like dynamic or high stretch you really mm-hmm. don't want the life safety rope to be too too stretchy because uh, that can that can lead to sad things for people <laughs> <right>? <laughs> especially so, in like a really long system when uh 
I have a quick story of that. So my cousin and I, we were, uh, he was really getting into climbing and I used to climb. So he was like, Hey man, he's like, do you want to do a lead climbing class with me? And I'm like, yeah, I never did lead climbing. I'll get into that with you. And, um, so he was like buying some gear and stuff like that. And he was like really getting into it and he wanted to go do some climbing outside. And so I'm like, do you have a rope? He's like, no, I'm like, well, I said, let's, let's buy a rope. We'll split a rope. We have it. We'll have everything we need to go climbing. So we bought a rope. And, uh, so when we, after we did the lead climbing class, we set him up on his rope and my cousin's, he's not a huge guy. He's probably like 130, 140 pounds, but it was in New Bedford. And I forget how tall their walls are, but say like 45 feet tall or 60 feet tall. They got huge walls out there. He's about 40 feet up in the air, right? So now you have probably 80 feet of rope out or whatever it was, right? It was a lot of rope, whatever it was, 60, right. 80 feet. And so I'm keeping all the tension there and he's like going to hook into his next thing and he's like, you got me. And I'm like, so I like like good have good tension on this rope. But he fell and he whipped hard, like probably like dropped like eight, 10, 12. I don't know what it was. It was, a, I was surprised because I, Pull tension on the rope very quickly. Enough for a pucker factor. And yeah, yeah, he was like losing his mind up there. One of the more experienced guys said, "Hey," he said, "He's like, don't let him down." He's like, "Stay up there. You just whipped. It was your first time. Just realize that you're alive, and then keep climbing." Nice. And it was like one of those things, man. It was just like yeah. that rope stretched a lot more than I thought it was gonna. Right. And I had tension on that rope, dude. It yeah. was crazy. Yeah. And that's yeah. with like a 140, 150 pound individual. Yeah. Not 300 pounds of gear. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you take, you know, 175 pound guy plus the harness, additional equipment. Yeah. Plus the stokes. Yep. Plus your victim. Yep. You're like probably well over 500 pounds. So mm-hmm. if you, I mean, that's why you, that's why with like, you know, with life safety, you have like, extremely high safety factor you have multiple lines in play so mm-hmm. if something fails there's a way to like mitigate and correct that um but yeah it's not a it's not a free ride you know what i mean like you're you're gonna go for, you'll yeah. be okay but you're gonna yeah. you're gonna right. yeah you're gonna have a pucker factor for, yeah. for feel sure. it. yeah yeah it's, it's, it's interesting so some of the common terms uh with rope uh so you have the kern and the kern is the is the core of the rope right so you can clearly see you have the sheath uh, and the core not attached, but this is kind of like splaying open the rope. Uh, the, and the mantle is the sheath. So I used to get like messed up because I used to think of like the mantle as like the center of the oh, We're entering the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> like the center of the earth. The right? earth. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, I just want to know uh, who was like, hey, we we'll just call this the core and this the sheath. And they're like, no, 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 no. Yeah, it right. will be the kern be the and the, the mantle. Uh, and you can see the the different types of twists. So based on the, you can have a Z twist, you can have an S twist, uh, and you can it depends on how many uh, fibers can be in the middle too is like what that rope is rated for. Uh, but understanding like, hey, kern, when someone says like they're talking about the kern, they're referencing the core. Uh, and then when they talk about the mantle of the rope, they're actually talking about the physical sheath that protects the internal fibers uh, from daily wear and tear. And just like anything else, right, rope has limitations. Um, and just understanding what the limitations of those systems are uh, is how you, you know, you plan accordingly to dev- uh, design a system uh, that is uh, safe and reliable for whatever it is you're trying to do, right? So like any other tool, um, we have to take care of take care of rope. You got to take care of the, the tools that are associated with it, right? They require upkeep, upkeep and care to make sure that they're working appropriately and w- ready when needed. Uh, so again, this is kind of like my list of things that I think are important, um, at least in understanding kind of like the basics of the rope world. So understanding dynamic forces, which we've kind of talked about, right. And static and dynamic and like, like your cousin, for example, like Mm -hmm. he's dropping X amount of feet like that is probably a more, uh, I mean, it's not life safety. Uh, uh, that ropes life safety. Yeah. Life safety. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're dealing with dynamic forces in that case where you're exerting pressure and force on the rope. It's a baby bowling. Hell yeah. Um, but you have to understand the concept of dynamic energy, right? So the, the best way to understand that is dynamic energy is just energy that's generated by movement, right? So if a rope was attached to a falling object and used to arrest its fall, then the energy of the object would be transferred to the rope, right? That's kind of common sense, right? So in your case, your cousin, right? He's the, mm-hmm. the falling object. As that rope arrests his fall, the, the shock load of his body weight being arrested in time and space. I feel like I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Um, Pretty good explanation. Yeah. Sound just like him. Yeah. That energy is transferred to the rope, 
right? So sometimes if you have like a shock load like that, we'll talk about whether you need to take a rope out of service if right. it's been significantly shock loaded or repeatedly shock loaded, uh, depending how much <coughs> weight and how much uh, um, weight that rope is uh, rated for, right? Um, so in effect, uh, this transferent would be dynamic tensioning the rope, shock loading the system, right? So um, whether you have like a, a five foot fall or, or a 10 foot fall, you're still exerting, you know, a five foot fall and you have 500 pounds worth of weight in the system. That's significant. Even, you know, a hundred, 140 pounds, but you're arresting that fall and it's a 12 foot jaunt. That's a significant mm -hmm. chocolate to the system. Right. So residual strength uh, is the remaining strength left in a rope that has been used for a period of time. So like anything else, um, ropes lose their strength over time and you can also induce uh, strength loss in the system um, whether that's a change of direction, uh, whether that's utilizing tools, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit further. But over time, just like anything else, uh, like you have a brand new tool, it has a lot of like tensile strength, right? Rope uh, applies to the same principle. Um, as the internal core is utilized over and over again, and talk about sometimes like, I don't know if you guys have ever done, like rope has its own memory, right? So if you're uh, continuously up and down on a system all day, um, this is, I think it was like a good example of like exert, like visually seeing like the forces exerted on a rope. So if we had like a 250 uh, foot rope segment that were up and down in a system all day, yeah. at the beginning of the day, the rope is easily maneuverable. Um, you can do like whatever you want with it. It's very, very manipulable. If you have like 500 pounds going up and down, up and down all day, like the memory of that rope is going to become like brittle and like kind of, I mean, it's still like maneuverable. But you can see, like, the forces exerted on that as the rope is <coughs> tensioned throughout the day. Um, so the rope actually has is at, um, at the brunt of the forces exerted on it, right? So residual strength is the remaining strength left in a rope after it's been used for a period of time. Uh, as rope is used, like we talked about, those high load forces, abrasion, and other factors uh, combine to reduce the overall strength of the rope. There's ways that we can account for that. Uh, factors that affect the rope usually are, like we talked about, your cousin, for example, going for a ride, arresting a fall, uh, exposure to corrosive chemicals, sunlight, abrasion, etc. So when we use life safety rope, we're, we're sometimes entering like an IDLH environment or in an environment that's not super ideal. Um, there can be, you know, we, we use, we try to accommodate for that as much as possible by protecting the rope. You can put it in a sheath, you can utilize edge protection, um, but we're exposing the rope to less than ideal environment, right? So if we're in like a, a parking garage, there can be glass, there can be dust, and it might be, they don't have to be necessarily large. Like you have small pieces of glass, you have motor oil. We do everything we can to, to get out of that environment, but we're, you know, in our line of work, you're exposing rope to an environment that's less than ideal. Mud, ice, whatever. Gen generally every time you use it. Generally every time you use it, right? Um, so it's important to understand that all those factors, you know, whether they're, you know, like big things, like you think like a corrosive material or just like dirt and debris over time that's going to affect the ability of the rope to maintain its integrity. Um, and the way that you can account for that is by using a rope log, right? So for most life safety ropes, um, some can be like more formal or informal. Sometimes they're in the bag. Sometimes they're made just maintained on like a Excel spreadsheet, right? But it's just generally um, a log should be maintained anytime the rope uh, is used, anytime the rope is maintained and cared for uh, and any significant events, um, like if the rope's been shock loaded, something like that, you know, if, if the event is big enough, they're going to obviously take the rope out of service. It's no longer um, functioning. Or if you're, you know, you're checking your rope and you notice like a, an abrasion or a cut that's significant, that's affecting the integrity of the rope, then you're taking it out of service. But all that stuff should be documented in a rope log, right? Uh, and then cleaning of rope. Uh, a lot of people don't think about cleaning rope, uh, but you should be doing it, right? So should life safety rope become dirty, which like we said, like is fairly common in, in our line of work, probably a probability, right? Uh, washing and cleaning with water. Uh, you just use pretty benign chemicals. It's just like kind of you're allowing it to air dry. It's kind of similar to like a hose hose line, right? Um, uh, with clean water, allowing it to air dry. You can use a mild detergent if the rope's extremely dirty uh, and, uh, and water. Um, but like just using that stuff alone uh, is not going to remove dirt and debris. So if you have that much dirt and debris in your rope, you might have to have a conversation about removing that from active service. Um, you shouldn't be using like extremely abrasive stuff that's going to like affect the sheath or potentially penetrate to where like, hey, like at this point the rope is kind of degraded to the point that maybe you shouldn't be using this life safety rope. Um, but generally soap and water, sometimes you can use a mild detergent, let it air dry, don't expose it to the sun. You know, they have the concepts of like dry rot, right? But it can affect the integrity of the rope. 
Uh, try to avoid using extremely hot water. Um, when I was looking at it, it was like greater than 110 degrees, which I don't think is that hot. But no, that's know. pretty hot. I don't know what you can get out of here. I don't. Yeah. If you get in a, if you get in a 110 degree shower, that's hot. Huh. Yeah, I, I do enjoy hot showers. What is a hot tub? I think I think um, like your water heaters at home are five. Yeah, yeah, I think your water heaters at home are like 110 or 15 is their huh. like general sure. setting. Nothing over 120. 120 will scald, hmm. I believe. Anyway, um, like I, I think the best way to carry it is like don't do anything like extreme, like anything like far out, right? So extremely hot water, use like a mild detergent, nothing extreme. Um, don't use a mild brush. You're not using like a wire brush that's going to immediately destroy your rope uh, and allow it to dry out of direct sunlight, right? Just kind of hang it over the rafters, allow, allow that to air dry and then... And then repack it and put it in service, and then document on your rope log that you did it. They have a uh, like rope cleaners, right? That yeah. hook up to the hose, spray the jet of water, and have brushes. And so you just pull the rope through, and as you pull it through, it just kind of yeah. washes it. Yeah. But point being, it's it's not like a uh, extremely aggressive process. But people, a lot of people, don't think that like, oh, like I use the rope, like I need to clean it, right? You know, but you right. you do, right? just like any other tool. Rope's a tool. We need to take care of it. We, we clean our tools. You Company should. pride will. Company pride. We'll clean our tools. Company pride. Just kidding. Company pride. Uh, so, like we talked about, uh, residual strength. Um, so, this is where we're incorporating tools and knots. Sorry to assault the microphone. Um, when you incorporate tools and knots, uh, a lot of times these tools are extremely beneficial. A lot of times these knots are extremely beneficial. They allow us to do our job. But you need to understand that, like, as you incorporate these additional factors, you're incorporating a, potentially an additional failure point, you're incorporating an additional variable, and you're potentially reducing the strength of the rope based on what you're doing. So a rope will never be stronger than when it's just in its straight linear form, right? So you're going to get your your 100% uh, of the rope's uh, strength, right? So within our systems, uh, we offer it, incorporate tools and knots to aid in our work. You know, we can use it to gain mechanical advantage, uh, amplify safety factors. However, it's important that we, we add those additional variables, their strengths and weaknesses for each. Sometimes they can, and they can add a strength, uh, and sometimes they can simultaneously add a strength and add a weakness. Right. So we talk about tools like carabiners, pulleys, plates, descent devices, personal safety systems. All must be understood within the total totality of the system that you're using. So understanding like, hey, like I'm incorporating in a change of direction. I'm incorporating in multiple pulleys. So like you're you're you can utilize a pulley. Uh, to gain mechanical advantage, but understand that like, hey, whether that's like a working pulley or a change of direction, you're potentially losing the strength, the strength of the rope. Uh, and a lot of times, I didn't. I wish I had put it in here. Um, the like the strength of the rope is based on like the angle of the pulley is how much you're losing, like the degree mm -hmm. at which you're shifting that rope in time and space. Um, but on here, uh, here's some basic knots uh, to where to kind of give you guys. A demonstration some of them are significant like you don't think about it right so like i said uh the best scenario is you're just utilizing the rope in like a straight linear form you have 100 percent of the rope's rated strength right throw in a simple figure eight and you're already down to 75 to 80 percent um bowling and that's why like that's why we have like such a especially in like life safety like you have like so these ropes are rated for like obscene amounts of weight right so whether it really matters um to us especially when you have like your main line and your secondary line or your, like your main and your belay, um, you're always going <coughs> up one, but like, you know, whether 75, you're, you know, if you have like a, if you're repelling with like a single person or you're lowering a single person um, and that rope is rated for like 2,000 pounds and you have 300 pounds in the system, like, okay, like 75 to 80% of that is not a big deal. But if you're starting to incorporate in a person uh, or like a, a victim or rescuer equipment tools, and you're using a bowline or you're using like a, you know, glow pitch, that's 60 to 65%. So that's where you need to start incorporating and understanding like how much uh, you're potentially losing in the system. Right. So I'll just kind of list off the common ones, right? So figure eight, you're down to about 75 per 80% of the rope's original strength. Uh, bowline, 70, uh, 70, 75 square knot. Uh, that's the big one, 43 to 70%, um, depending um, and then like a clove hitch is 60 to 65%, um, or an overhand half hitches, right? 60 to 70%. 
normally for half hitches, I, I usually use like a half hitch for like a tool like to just keep it right. You know. Keep it upright. Yeah. So, you know, whether it really matters on a tool that's like 20 pounds, but just having a good understanding of that, if you're adding additional complexity, you're adding an additional variable into the system, there is a consequence. Right. right. Um, and you can offset for that by having rope that's rated, you know, or utilizing tools. Carabiners. Um, we always say like, make sure, you know, this, I, I would say it's probably common sense, but like a lot of, you know, um, people that are getting initial exposure, right? So like the anatomy of the carabiner, um, you always want to load the spine in that like kind of like vertical format, right? That's how it's rated for. So when you see like a carabiner that's rated for a lot of times it's rated in kilonewtons, which I think is like 220 pounds. I don't know, but I'll, I, I'll I know kilonewtons is yeah, common. Um, it's a lot. I'll, I'll look it up. It's a um, thousand, it's, it's it's a like thousand newtons. Actually, I'm look it up. <laughs> I think it's 220 pounds. Or Big something. Newtons. It's a lot. You're a lot. Kilo Newton. Can we get elevator music again? All right. Yeah, that was close. Um, oh, so right. one kilo Newton is 224.8 blah, 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 pounds. So 225. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right. So you we have like significant safety factors built in, but understanding that like you need to load a carabiner on its proper axis. So if you look at the bottom, um, they call uh, offloading off the axis, right? So you're kind of compromising the integrity and the intended design of that carabiner. So you need to load it from the spine. So for those that are, are um, watching it, if you have the, the top portion of your load is the green and then you have the bottom portion, you're using it to connect two systems um, or within a system, you want to make sure that the, the green and the yellow are parallel to each other and you're loading the spine. Uh, first of all, three lay loading is also caution, right? Um, you want to make sure that the, the forces exerted on that carabiner are, are as designed, right? So some more key terms in the rope world, um, some of which you guys will, you know, if you've been to the academy, you've definitely heard some of these terms. Uh, if you've had any exposure to rope, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll definitely hear these terms. So you have your running end, right? That's your working end of the rope. Uh, so that's the end of the rope that you'll manipulate uh, most act uh, mostly to, you know, actively tie a knot or suspend something. So I never heard the term uh, the bitter end, uh, but I've heard the term standing end. Um, the end of the rope that is not being used uh, in the knot you are tying, so the opposite end to the running end. So that's usually like your hauling side, right, where your hauling team is. Uh, a bite, um, I would have spelt it differently. Uh, but any rope uh, that does not double back on itself without crossing over. Loop, right, when a bite crosses over itself. So if you make a loop. Yep. We have a demonstrator here in the background. Nice. There we go. Uh, a knot. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, shit. <laughs> I don't even know how I did that. <laughs> if you can't tie a knot, tie a lot. Um, so an intertine looper rope used to fat. Oh, Jesus. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> used to fasten uh, two ropes together. Uh, a bender, a hitch. So ways of fastening two ropes together. Um, uh, a hitch will not hold its form uh, when it's not wrapped around something. Uh, splice uh, made by untwisting two ropes and weaving them together. You really won't do that. Um, and then current mantle or the core sheath where we talked about the current and the mantle. Uh, it's a balance construction uh, consisting of uh, continuous filament polyester. So um, those are kind of the key terms in the rope world. Uh, and I do have some videos because we all love videos um, to kind of just show some of the basic hauling techniques. Are these you? No, these are not. Uh, the next video, though, I really like because he's like Australian and I always – I. If you have an issue, I just innately trust that what you have to say. Like, <laughs> all right, mate, you're going to grab this piece of rope right here. I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm grabbing it. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, no, this just shows, um, this is about a nine-minute video, so we won't watch all of it, so I'll kind of skip around, but it shows, like, some basic hauling techniques. Uh, I thought this was a good video that demonstrates kind of the day-to-day -day, uh, life safety. Shout out to Miramar Fire for their awesome graphics as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's intense. Miramar where? in California. So everyone's probably familiar with these. When we're gonna be setting a chainsaw up, okay, you're gonna go ahead, you're gonna make sure that you do give yourself enough slack in your uh, bite, or you give yourself a big enough bite. So we're gonna go ahead, create a figure eight on a bite. So I'm gonna take about, one. You should definitely. maybe a little bit longer than the length of the blade. We're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna create my figure eight here. Now 
Make sure that's nice and tight. Then we're going to go ahead and go through the handle. So right in the back. We'll go straight through the handle. If you have to, you kind of stick the knot through. And then we'll wrap around. And this is going to go around the, saw starts and cuts the, rope the entire <laughs> saw through the back. Go all the way, all the way, and then from here, I'm going to go ahead and just pull that knot back through, and you have your figure eight on a bite, and we're just going to send it up. We're just going to send So when we're going to be sending the Helligan tool up, okay, we're going to do it the same way that we did the axe. So we're gonna have the pick and the ads on the bottom, and then we'll go ahead and have the fork over at the top. We'll do the same thing. We're gonna create a clove over on this end. We're actually gonna wrap around the ads, coming straight up, half, half. So let's go ahead, start with the clove. We have that, we're gonna make sure that it's on properly. So wrap that around, coming all the way through. Go ahead, tighten this real quick. There's multiple ways. Of, so you can see I have my upline so like here, which go. is going to be pulling down. I like doing that clove. So I'm going to go ahead, so easy. Just wrap it underneath, and I'll stop about halfway. Now from here, just go ahead, create your half, pull tight. Last one up top right here. Same thing, create your half. Everyone's confident until it's and pull tight. like, hey, I'm going to lower this down. And and I'm like, ah! Is how or you tie that clove hitch yeah. and you start the lowering something and let's go. Like, <laughs> Whoopsie. Wasn't me. Wasn't me. My bad. So when we're sending an axe up, we're going to go ahead and make sure that the head of the axe is facing down and the handle is going to be aligned with our upline. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. We're going to start with the clove hitch on this side. But it's actually going to wrap Usually underneath I just the like head to those and out the ensure window. that if you can axe just doesn't remember, slip like out while we're figurine. hoisting it up. So we'll go ahead yeah. and like a half make hitch. our clove. That's pretty much. And we're going to make sure it's loaded properly because remember, we're going to be pulling down. So I'm going to slip it on right here all the way down. I'm going to cinch that nice and tight. Now, this is my upline. On this side, this upline is going to go underneath. See how it catches right here. So you're going to wrap so that. So which end do you guys think is the working And then side? we'll create a half probably about midway through. Yeah. Andy's working with. So right here, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but but create your if it's half. moving in the system. It's the end you're pulling. That's yeah. cinched right here. And then we'll go ahead, Touché. create one more <laughs> half. I thought I tried to like word that as like a good question. Nice and like, tight. <laughs> and then. This is how we would send it up. And the other so side. So we're sending the charge hose line up. We're gonna go ahead and start with the clove hitch. So this about one, maybe three this to four inches one. below the coupling. And then we're gonna go ahead, create a bite. We're gonna go through the bale and then create a half. And then we'll do one last half hitch over by the nozzle. So we'll go ahead, start with the clove. It's at least two more half hitches than I would have done. Right here. And then we're gonna slip that over. About maybe three to four inches <clears throat> right here. We'll go ahead and cinch that nice and tight. Now we have our upline. I'm gonna go ahead, we'll create a bite straight through the bale. Now you're gonna make sure, create that good half, pull that nice and tight right here over the bale to ensure that it stays closed. And then we're gonna go right, ahead, <laughs> give it one more <laughs> this last one I can. I can't half hitch. Here. Someone's calling for water. Hold like, on, I gotta do one more. We can get a third one on and there. And this is how we would send it <laughs> Yeah, you gotta make sure that the, uh, up. the nozzle doesn't uh, rotate. Yeah. All right, so those are kind of the basic ones that I want to show you, like the basic uh, hauling of tools, hauling of lines. Um, so if we're going to be sending... Uh, we can skip the pike ball. Um, but, you know, the, the general conversation, it's a kind of a quick hitter episode that opens, up, opens us up uh, to further rope conversations. 
Uh, I will provide like a brief overview of basic mechanical advantage of uh, a three to one. We won't get into that a lot, but this guy's Australian, so you can trust him. Um, <laughs> but just like hauling, uh, generally, like, you know, people think about like, oh, like, you know, using rope, being proficient with rope, like it's not just extending to technical, the technical rescue realm. Uh, it's everything from the day to day around the station, from the water rescue to marine operations to, uh, just passing up a flathead axe to passing up, uh, uh, a charged, uh, charged hose line, uh, all the way to having someone on the system. So this guy provides a, a brief, uh, good explanation of two to one and three to one mechanical advantage. Uh, so this is where you're, where you're using ropes and pulleys to, uh, to gain, um, strength within, within a system. So. Rope Lab is a really good resource, by the way, for those that want to. <laughs> it's a nice slogan. Hi, I'm Richard Delaney from Rope Lab. There's been quite a bit of discussion recently about the mechanical advantage offered by these four systems here. These four systems are basically the same. This is the You're most 100% simple. You're 100% right. I immediately like trust this guy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Now, the conjecture comes <coughs> in consideration of what is the mechanical advantage of this system, and is it different if the person on the ground does the pulling? or if I do the pulling myself. Now it's a little bit confusing because people have traditionally assumed that any pulley attached here is a stationary pulley and anything attached to the load is a moving pulley. If the person on the ground is doing the work, then that's true. Now the other half of the language or the equation that's been left out in that discussion of moving and stationary pulleys is the significance of the frame of reference. What that means is who is doing the work. They define the frame of reference. And ultimately with mechanical advantage, Mechanical advantage is technically the ratio of the applied force to the input force. If my person on the ground is doing the lifting, then obviously this is a system that is two to one, where that top pulley is a redirection. If, they, if I weigh 100, if I leave out units, if I weigh 100, they'll apply 50 and I'll start to go up, or 50 in a little bit. Now, when I take the rope myself, that frame of reference now becomes the load. And when I do this work, that pulley appears to be getting closer to me. So that now becomes a moving pulley, and this one is a stationary pulley. If I weigh 100 to be suspended and not moving, then I would have 33 and a third in each of these strands of rope. As soon as I pull a little bit more than 33 and a third, I start to go up. So I weigh 100, I'm applying 33 and a third, so the ratio of that as an ideal mechanical advantage is 3 to 1. What about the amount of rope that goes I'm gonna need. System? I'm going to need Neil deGrasse Tyson. There's another way we can check mechanical <laughs> advantage. Work equals force times distance. So if I give the rope to the person on the ground, Neil. if there's Please. one metre plus one metre of rope here, they will measure two metres of rope going through their hands, and at that point I will be at the top. Now, if I take the rope myself and I'm the one doing the pulling, if I have a rope counter attached to my harness or a small winch, so point being, very smart guy. Listen to him. Um, I just, I, I'm, I, I just, I, now I want to learn more because that. Hi, I'm Richard. Blaine I just don't. That baffles me of why his it being in his hand versus somebody else's changed that completely. So that's interesting. <laughs> it is interesting, and you can spend a lot of time, like anything, you can spend a lot of time. The beauty of that's not what it is. It's the amount of ropes. If you have one pulley up at the top then you divide it's the amount of rope so it's like one would be 100 percent, two would be 50 percent, and then if he has to loop it on another pulley there's one two three ropes it's 33 and a third no i know but it's if, so if somebody on the ground grabs that in it's still going through the same amount of pulleys no it's it wasn't he had to add the other pulley so that it would be okay i think he's referring to like a change so I, i'd have to rewatch it but like my under of what he's trying to say so like the the best like at a fundamental level without like super confusing the audience as far as like too late mechanical advantage and like uh change of direction versus like something that's in the system so a change of direction is is not a moving pulley right it's just vec it's call it vectoring right. so you're just changing your direction a mechan like the actual moving pulleys are pulleys involved in the system so what nick is saying is right when you have three working lines you have a three to one so you have the three lines that are moving within the system so was 30 there the forces exerted on that are 33 and a third i understand preach. but i i think what he like i understand what you're saying like how is if a, if another person is holding it simply versus him like how is that changing yeah i don't think that it does i'm i'm, I'm not an expert because you're still exerting the each rope is like f holding like 
33 and a third of his body weight. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So I'm agreeing with. Let's move on. Okay. All right. <laughs> Anyways. Um, and then the only other thing I had wanted to like for basic mechanic, you know, we, we'll get into like Z rigs and other stuff at a, at, a, at a later date, but like understanding like mechanical advantage, like while it, it gains you, um, it provides like added strength within a system. So like, um, you have three times the ability of one person to lift, right? So if you had a three to one or a five to one or a nine to one mechanical advantage, like realize one, it gets like, it can actually get like super dangerous if you're at like a higher end, like a nine to one mechanical advantage. Cause if you pull too far, like you could tear people. somebody apart, yeah, yeah. tear someone apart. Uh, but also understanding that like, say for like a five to one, right? So for us to, to gain that five to one mechanical advantage, we have to move five feet of rope on the hauling side to move one foot of time and space within the system. So there's pros and cons, right? You're gaining five times the normal force that one person could pull, but the lap side of that is like, you're going to need a lot of rope within your system. Right. Yeah. Um, so like, and like we talk about on the show, like no one's like reinventing the wheel. Like none of this stuff is like, I, you know, I, like I said, like I consider myself to have like a, a decent, like good, like foundational knowledge. I'm still trying to learn and rope is a very perishable skill. So you have to continuously do it. Um, but like nothing here is like job talks, like patent pending, right? Like the beauty of uh, modern times is like, if you want to learn something, a lot of times you can go find it in a book or you can find it on right. the internet. Like, so if like this guy is not your, you know, a cup of tea of like the way that he's explaining it doesn't make sense. You can find another 10, 15 subject matter experts online. Just make sure you vet um, whoever, you know, using a reputable source. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rope Lab is good, um, but there's a lot of different sources out there. There's a lot of different sources of information, a lot of great websites um, that can offer, like, a good uh, intro to whatever it is you're trying to do. What I would have to do is literally use all these systems. Yeah, yeah I would have to Put my well. hands on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that's just... I know people who can like read books and then it's like, oh yeah, not yet. And they legitimately like they do. I always have to put my hands on stuff like this. But I, I mean, same. I get the gist of like what he's saying, but to actually, it's just like, like we're talking about before, like gaining a working knowledge, right? It's like, okay, I understand what he's saying, but I'll never be able to replicate it until I actually do it and then have to use it in a situation. Right. Like recognize, okay, this is what I have to do. Right. Implement it, put it through. That's why I said <laughs> just move on because I'm not. You can you can explain it to me twelve times. I'm not. Gonna <laughs> I see what you're saying. It's, it's not worth it's not worth the audience's yeah. time. So the best, uh, like I said, one of the best ways to understand it is like if the pulley is moving, it's mechanical advantage. If yeah. the pulley is stationary, it's a change of direction. Yeah. Right. So, and remember, with those changes of directions, uh, with the addition of knots, with the addition of you know, depending on what you're vectoring at, you're going to be losing potentially losing strength in the system, right? So mm-hmm. these are all factors that you have to. Kind of, and again, you can, you know, you have a super high safety factor, but understand like the angles and the forces that we're exerting in the system all has an effect on the rope, right? The rope is just a tool like anything else. Uh, it has its limitations. So, uh, like I said, just a general conversation on rope. Uh, it affects you probably way more than you think it does. Um, whether you're on, you know, a regional tech rescue team, career tech rescue team, all the way down to a small call and volunteer department, um, you hauling a line, right? You're you're using a rope. You're Rit, using rope teams, rip teams, everything. Yeah. It's all all rope. Um, and you got to be proficient with it. So. My favorite time of year is when we get to go do the ice rescue and we get to use like the ropes with the carabiners that attach to my suit. So they <laughs> they're just, already tied. So they can just yeah, exactly. They're <laughs> yeah. already tied. They just clink right on, and then you just drag me yep. back out yeah. of the. I'll go get in the water. You do this. Stuff. My favorite. Yeah. My favorite thing to do. Little, yeah. yeah. My favorite thing to do is to run as fast as I can out on the ice and then like seal slide right into the water. <laughs> it's my favorite thing. I'm coming to get you. So, like awesome. seal the singer or seals seals. Yes. Seal, seal the animal. Yeah, seal the animal. Little boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, like I said, just a general uh, intro. We're gonna have some really proficient people on that are I consider to be true subject matter experts. Uh, in the coming uh, coming episodes, so stay tuned for those. Um, but that's all I got. Hopefully, it was interesting. Um, if there's anyone that wants to chime in, that's a true subject matter expert. We obviously always welcome, uh, people's input and guidance because we're, we're learning along the way as well. hundred percent. I'll turn it over to my esteemed colleagues to take us out.
Thanks, guys. Uh, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, give us feedback when and where you want to. Job talks out.